Hey everyone, welcome to the Creative Leadership Podcast 2021. Do you believe it? Oh my God, I'm so happy 2020 is gone. Um, so let's hope this year is going to be so much better. My name is Arne van Oosterum and this show is broadcasted uh, to you from Blue Sky Republic. Uh, the show is for all the creative doers and thinkers and generalists and navigators and innovators and change makers and outside the box thinkers and misfits and all those folks who sometimes feel lost in the space in between. This podcast is for you. Today I talk to Sarah Cox. Sarah is an expert in design thinking, innovation, program development, and uh, she trains corporate entrepreneurs and innovation leaders. She calls herself a misfit, but I don't know, she actually is always looking to build bridges. Uh, and I kind of talked to her about how she grew up, what shaped her, and how she creates safe spaces for the creative team she works with. And safe spaces, I think that's such a fascinating and important topic for all those creative leaders, servant leaders, uh, you know, all those people who try to make a change and a difference in this world. So um, I enjoy. If I had to describe myself, I would probably say that I am a bit of a social misfit who fits between lots of different groups and works in lots of different areas and tries to figure out how to bring people together to create something greater than they'd be able to do on their own. I try to match up those shared areas of interest and join the dots so the right people can start working together to create something that is, you know, mutually interesting and of uh, great value, hopefully. A social misfit is an interesting word. So... <laughs> <laughs> how how do you how do you become a social misfit? Is that um, where where did that happen? I that that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's something I've been bouncing around a little bit. Uh, we and I'll uh, I'll admit you helped me out quite a, a, quite a lot recently. Um, Post lockdown, I set up a community that we've called the Confab, which means uh, I think the idea is con to to uh, be with. And fab to make, to fabricate, but also it can mean kind of confabulate, which I believe means to come up with a load of nonsense. Right. Um, and one of the, uh, you very, very kindly joined us for a session to explore uh, some kind of different creative, creative ways of working virtually, which was really insightful for us. Um, and one of the ideas we we're talking about, how do we categorize this group that we've created? And the one thing that kept coming to my mind was the misfits. Because I think a lot of people who get into creative roles or um, my role is in what I'd say uh, design strategy, design thinking, for those who use that terminology, um, a lot of people within those spaces, I think, find themselves a little bit sort of as misfits. They uh, chart their own path to an extent. They don't necessarily fit neatly within any one um, uh, box but also they you know I think misfits sometimes like novelty and like to try and explore new areas and I find myself in that space a lot I want to be helping people solve problems that are really frustrating them and I think that's what motivates me and it probably comes a little bit from um, I suppose my childhood my upbringing I've always been someone who didn't necessarily fit neatly within any social group. I never had like mm. a, a click or anything. Um, I just kind of floated a lot between lots of different groups and um, always expected that or got used to having friends and collaborators and people close to me who came from all, you know, all of loads of different backgrounds, loads of different um, disciplines and interests, loads of different walks of life. And those tend to be, uh, the people that I find myself maybe most drawn to when I'm uh, either in a personal or a professional context, the mm -hmm. individuals who don't necessarily neatly fit in. Um, and, you know, but as a result of have this, I suppose, empathy for those individuals who, you know, we all come into a group and we all feel a little bit awkward. And I think any leader or anyone who is trying to build a community needs to have a good view of what makes people feel like they belong, what makes them comfortable what might make, what might be an impediment to them engaging effectively. And I try to pull on that, my, you know, my own experience of feeling like I'm, I don't quite fit in. 
that I work with others as well. So I go back to 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 you because you said it comes from my probably you know it comes from my childhood or or it's that that's kind of where you if you reflect back on your childhood that you 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 kind of recognize that kind of you know you know that kind of personality trait of being the misfit and not being able to or not being connected uh, somehow to to kind of groups and. What, how did you experience that as a child? Was that something you were aware of? Like you, like, you know, did you feel because that's you know, in a way that that sounds a bit like, um, you know, that sounds lonely. If I, you know, mm-hmm. like oh, you know, you don't connect to to uh, to groups, and I I relate to that um, myself because <laughs> I said <laughs> drink because I, I I had the same, but I do kind of when I you know I go back and think about how I sort of didn't really connect it was also because I was very shy and I always felt insecure and so because I did I really did want to connect but I, mm-hmm. I somehow I I would describe myself as a misfit I guess but I didn't feel like a misfit I just felt like shy and insecure mm-hmm. so how did you how did you experience that I don't know if I would use the if I would have used the term misfit back then. Um, mm. And maybe it's kind of like reclaiming of a label somewhat. Yeah, but, well, yeah, um, sure. But uh, yeah, I, I think I was conscious of it when when I was younger. I was I think there was a few uh, factors involved. One, maybe just intrinsic personality, and in that I am quite shy and possibly a bit more introverted. I'm the type of person who, you know, if I meet someone and we've got I'm, I can find something in common with anyone I speak with, but I'm better on sort of a one-to-one basis because I feel like I can build that um, that connection with mm. someone and figure out what it is yeah. that they're interested in and, and learn from them. Um, but I think when I was a child, yeah, I was I was an only child. I lived quite far from my school, and I think there were a few kind of you know just quite tangible barriers that you know I used right. to play alone a lot and became quite imaginative and um, right. you know wrote a lot of stories and things like that. And I think that that translated in that I think it did probably lead to a few I didn't naturally fit in with my school peers um and I can see kind of maybe I can see with you as well that you know we if you felt that it shyer a little bit on the sidelines when you were younger when you become older because it wasn't natural to you to mm-hmm. have a group one you have to work harder to find them and you that group might not necessarily be the, the people who are most like you who you grew up with but also you have to work on those social skills of connecting and building bridges that I found quite useful as I've gotten older because I had to kind of work on it um, as I've kind of come into adolescence and beyond. Right. And where did you grow up? So I grew up in the northeast of England. Uh, I grew up in Jarrow, which is near um, Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, And I live back there now. So I'm uh, I've Lived, ah, right. I've lived a few places around the world and worked in other places within the UK and beyond. But yes, I'm back in my my hometown and have been for the last few years. Right. And and uh, um, and what did your parents do when you uh, were growing up? My mom was a uh, sort of a bank clerk, uh, worked mm. at a bank. And my dad used to be a bus driver, but got injured when I was quite young. Oh, really? So he was on what you'd call incapacity benefit. And he sort of took care of me when I was, uh, when I was younger. So we had sort of the role re- gender role reversal of the stay-at-home parent. Ah, right. But, and, and, but are there things like, because often like for me, I see things, you know, within myself, I, I, I you know, some, some things that some, character traits i have that are that you know are very you know i I, more and more i'm thinking like oh i'm gonna be just like my father you know or or like oh i can hear myself say things that i'm thinking oh that's just my just my dad or or you know certain things that my mother uh, uh you know actually think my mother actually went through as a as a child that I think when I was in my 30s, I think that that's when I started realizing certain things had an effect on me as well, even though I wasn't my experience, I, you know, because my mother had a very bad childhood, 
um, but it had an effect on me. So, but also just their, their you know, the characters, uh, you know, the, and actually both of them are voices in my head in a way, if I think mm-hmm. about it, like my mother is more the artists and, and she's more about feeling things. And my father's more the scientist and he's more like, if you can't measure it, it's not true. And uh, so, <laughs> and I have both of these voices in my head and they're always fighting. Like, uh, um, but I'm, I'm leaning more towards my mother's side because I'm, I'm more of an artist and a, and a designer and creative. But there's still this, my father's kind of skeptical, mm-hmm. cynical side there. Like, like, yeah, right. Well, I, you know, so one of the things my father would often say is like, if I would pro- proclaim something, would, would have an opinion about something, he would say, well, I don't know. Let, let's look, look that up and see if that's actually true. And I'm like, gosh, <laughs> shut up. Shut up. It's true. It's That's true. Not what I just this know. is about. This is not what this is about. <laughs> so are there things th- th- that you kind of recognize in yourself that you're saying, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, that's that really my that's my father. I think my my. Yes, I think so. It's like you said, the curse of becoming a parent. So maybe it's a blessing if you have got very good sure, parents sure. It asserts itself as you get older. And um, I think my my dad had the kind of bigger invert, like inverted commas personality so kind of more um louder more outgoing and so I think I kind of compared myself more to him growing up but we were both so yes in a way we were both very stubborn kind of willful people and he came from I suppose an, an older generation mm. uh, you know grew up in 1940s Glasgow as a kind of an Irish immigrant and had a relatively tough time of it mm. and uh, wanted to make sure that I was tough as well um so I've, I have, I think I've internalized a lot of those values. That so how how, do, how does that work? So he wanted you to be tough. Yeah. So I think. In what way tough? Uh, don't let anyone um, take advantage of you. You've got to stick up for yourself. Right. I think he was worried that I was, you know, all of his family uh, were in Ireland, and was worried that you know me being an only child, he was very sort of. Um, you know, sort of morbid from time to time. And he would sit me down for a talk of what, how I need to take care of my mom when he wasn't around anymore and these sorts of things. So he oh, just, really? he wanted me to be self-sufficient effectively. And that was what I was raised to be, to um, be able to take care of myself, to not need to rely on other people. And do you um, know how, how, how was, how, uh, in, you know, I'm just curious about how, how does that work in practice? How do you, how do you teach someone that, and besides, you know, obviously talking about that maybe or acting that way as a parent, but but how do you, how do you <laughs> I guess maybe that's a really good thing to teach my children. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing to teach, but it's interesting because I think... I think that I think that the only thing that children learn, and I think this is the same in you know the workplace or any groups that we are part of, mm-hmm. you know, you don't learn through being told, you learn through experiencing and right. seeing something acted out. And it's something that I try to do in my work life. I yeah. try to model the behaviors of um, being, you know, not ne- not necessarily ch- challenged, but being mm-hmm. productively questioned on things that I'm putting forward if I am. Right. You know, the, the leader of a project, for example. So I, I don't think that you can teach it through words, but I think mm. that that was the way that I mostly was taught. It's an interesting question that I may have to reflect on more. What did I witness of that? But yeah. I think I did kind of, I did internalize it quite a bit, but I think that um, maybe some of the lessons that I internalized weren't the most productive ones. And it's something that I've come to reflect on more as I've grown personally and professionally as well. And um, realized that, you know, the the idea of which was it was, you know, my, my dad was trying to teach me from his best experience and to give me, you know, the best start in life that he believed that I needed from his personal experience. But kind of it's the thing of what got you what gets you so far soon becomes like antiquated and outdated and it won't help you evolve to the next stage. So it might have helped kind of in, in, in my youth when I need to take care of myself. But as I've progressed as I have sought out sort of wider horizons you know you can't be totally self-reliant you Mm. can't set up a business or create a community or do anything that is more um that will have impact beyond yourself if you are holding yourself tight if you are wanting to be if you were wanting to be the leader if you're wanting to see your personal vision realized if you are looking to um 
yeah, to be the deciding voice or to not right. not risk being kind of challenged on anything. Mm-hmm. You know, you ha- I've, I've had to. So I think it's come from my upbringing uh, quite a lot that there are definitely great things of value. And I'm still incredibly close to my parents and they've taught me a huge amount. But there's also things that I've had to sort of unlearn. And that mm-hmm. has come from my upbringing. But it's also come from, I think, the education system as well. Um, we teach so much, the, you know, the value of being right, of having the right answer, mm-hmm. of, you know, it's, 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 it's right or it's wrong. Yeah. And um, there's a whole conversation to be, ha- to be had about the devaluing of creative education as well, because it's, it's more difficult to, uh, to assess or it's seen as less directly related to employment. But um, I think that the one thing I had, I was very, I, I quite unknowingly, because I didn't have anyone in my family who went to university, I mentioned I was I'm quite good at um, writing. I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite, I've always been quite academically adept, quite naturally. I can digest information quickly. I can regurgitate it on a page. Hmm. I always did well in school. But you were writing stories as a, as a, as a child, yes. right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so it's something that not only that it came easy for you. I mean, it's something you've been doing from a very young age, mm-hmm. as I at least that as I understood um, from your story. So that's a that's that's a um, and me being <laughs> having dyslexia. That to me was like <laughs> so jealous of that. I know. Uh, you know, being able to kind of just go boop. I can write. I can write it down, and it makes uh, yeah. So so but so um, going back a little bit. Um, to uh, you growing up, you um, you know you went through primary school, and 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 where did did you go after that? Um, I went on to secondary school and to what we call sixth form, so kind of education mm-hmm. between sixteen and eighteen. Right. Uh, when uh, I was in the UK, so we do A levels, and I did. Um, you know, I, I was always very torn between the the sciences and the arts. Right. And I sort of kind of maybe took almost a, a midpoint. So I did. I ended up focusing on law as one of my uh, one of my A levels, and went on to law school. And I think the reason mm. for that it wasn't. I didn't know anyone who was a lawyer. I didn't really have anyone to give me guidance on that. It was based. Right. On, That's a good job. And uh, people respect lawyers, ah. kind, kind of. <laughs> there might be a lot of bad jokes about them, but they have some social standing. And uh, it's a lot of like it's a lot of reading books or reading statutes and then writing. And I can do that. Right. Um, and that was the route that I went. And um, I fit within that niche quite well, as I mentioned, because of my education. Because it's very much you know what the, what you're told is your supervisor's time is incredibly valuable. So you need to get something as perfect as possible before you waste their time with it. You know, if you've drafted right. you've drafted a brief, um, make sure it's perfect before as, as perfect as you can get it before you waste their time effectively. And um, you know, so there was a lot of solitary working. There wasn't really much in the way of group working with books, and I was well suited to that. And I could churn out the um, you know, I could churn out kind of assignments and things like that. Not that it wasn't difficult at times, but I actually think I learned from there that I was quite stifled by um, the black and white learning of that. And I know that the law, if you, there, you know, the, the more the more senior you get, there is a lot of complexity and a lot of nuance. Mm. But at that early stage of my career, it was very much like it's right or it's wrong. And I found myself, you know, straining against that a bit. Um, and, you know, and did a very practical degree that you got, you would be qualified, you did a practical qualification alongside the law degree as well. Mm-hmm. So you would be ready to start working as a trainee solicitor at the end of it or a, or a trainee barrister and realized it was a very practical, sensible choice. And I realized throughout that it was kind of the wrong one. You know, I completed the degree, so I would have it on my CV, but I realized that the thing I really enjoyed was jurisprudence, the theory of the law. What is justice? You know, why do we make these decisions? Right. Mm. the more knotty questions and um and I kind of stumbled into immediately after I kind of submitted my final dissertation um joined a, a fast growing SME that a small medium sized business kind of an entrepreneurial business that a friend was working at they desperately needed someone because someone had just resigned uh, and it wasn't a particularly senior role but I needed work and I thought I'll do this for a month or two while I figure out my next steps and um yeah, kind of caught the entrepreneurship bug a bit. It was kind of like there was no guidance. There was no, not really many rules. 
company was growing quickly. And if you could identify an opportunity, you were given the latitude to explore it. How did you, how did you come across? I mean, because that, that's, that's, to me, that's a big leap, like, oh, and then you joined this fast growing as me. How, how, where, how did that happen? Did you, how did they find you? Did, how did you find them? It's, it sounds terrible because it's very much not kind of a meritocracy. It was just, uh, they had a, um, like an intern who had left. Um, right. And so basically they had a role for an intern and I had a friend right. who was working there as yeah, a receptionist. Sure. Mm-hmm. And she was like, oh, this guy's just like left today. Um, and we're, we're caught short. Could you help? So I got a foot in. I, literally, I was available. I, I, I turned up later that same day. I'd handed in my dissertation right. that morning. It was just being in the right place at the right time. Exactly. But obviously, being connected to someone who was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. of course. Success. And yeah, just started effectively as an intern and progressed quickly because it was, yeah, growing quickly. And um, I, be- I basically solved the problem that or, or solved designed myself out of a job within a fortnight by automating what was being done right. and then just kept kept doing that effectively like just finding problems to solve and they kept they kept me around um and yeah that kind of gave me more of an entrepreneurship bug and I did that for probably about a year before you know realizing actually I, I am quite academic I want to understand this more I want to kind of pick it apart um I've always kind of I realize I have this kind of uh drive to be sort of a practitioner academic so I want to be doing Mm -hmm. the thing but then I also want the time to reflect on how it works what is the best way of doing this and how can I communicate that to to others effectively Um, and that led me to doing uh, going back into study and research and um, went to do a uh, master's of science in entrepreneurship and innovation and then continued on to um, doing a uh, research project in design and business so that kind of led me back to kind of the the more not necessarily creative space but at that boundary between creativity and application that creativity sort of is that something that you were aware of that that is sort of the space that you would kind of kind of move into is that was that something you were interested in is it something you recognize as creative space i mean to me being a sort of i mean for me if, if you are kind of a misfit in a way and you're always kind of like because it does sound you kind of you know when you're you go to law school and you're kind of saying ah not exactly it you know, doesn't really fit i like parts of it but then i like to kind of introduce other parts into it and And then the academic world um, might allow you to be a little bit more of a misfit, I guess, because uh, because of the obviously because of the nature you have to do research. It's but how did how did you see that? Is that something that uh, you know this creativity, this creative space? Was it something you were aware of? Mm -hmm. Because where does it come from? Because I don't hear in the story you're you know you're writing stories. Yes. That, that mm-hmm. was one of the things, but it's not like you come from a creative family, you had mm-hmm. a creative environment. And so where did that come all of a sudden come from? I, d- I don't know if it was kind of like a, um, if it came from somewhere all of a sudden or whether it was more of a resurgence. I think that mm. I was always creative when I was younger. I liked, you know, art and music and literature. And I was really good at that, but I was also quite good at, you know, maths and science. I think I was more right. passionate about the arts, but I did not know anyone who did that as a job. Right. I didn't see any route to that. I, I, I don't, I can't remember how much of it was external, but I knew like, I didn't know any artists. I didn't know anyone who was a professional musician. I knew people who maybe like friends of my dad who had like a garage band that they'd been working at for 20 years, but then they right. went to work at the shipyard. You, you yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so uh-huh. like, yeah, um, I don't. Uh, so that was not clear. Uh, there was no profession. There wasn't like that. So that's how you can yeah. make a living. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. And okay. I, I, did, I did law because it was the sensible choice. There was a good job at the end of yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, and I think that, um, so I did get, so it was kind of coming back to it and coming almost coming at it the other way because I was, my research, I, I came back into the creative space through business, really, right. through, um, through entrepreneurship, which is a very, you know, pragmatic, you know, profit-focused, money-focused, business-focused way of, you know, creating something effectively. Mm-hmm. You know, you can say that an entrepreneur is creative. They create a new venture. They create sure. new value. Yeah. Um, but it was kind of through that. And I've built a great, or re-established my appreciation of creativity 
over time through coming at it through this business angle and meeting more people who were professional designers or you know, semi-professional designers and artists and, you know, musicians. And that has kind of, um, it, it, that has enabled me to, to come back to, I suppose, to, to learn from the way they tackle problems. Um, when I kind of came back into academia, I started researching this kind of, you know, design thinking was very much a buzzword. Um, but, you know, the, for example, uh, the design sprints weren't yet kind of commonly done within business yet. They had, mm. the, you know, the, the Jake Knapp book hadn't been published. Um, these kind of intensive collaborative interventions workshops were not commonly done um, across the business world. And mm. I, I was kind of at the, at the beginning of that becoming really part of the mainstream and started to explore it. And most people who come into looking at you, if you want to use the term design thinking it's there's a lot of debate around um it's how you know how the, the value of design thinking and how it how effectively it's applied in the business world but most people who come into that space they come from a design background they're creatives and they start they they're making products or communications mm -hmm. and they learn about service design and they learn about organizational design and then they mm -hmm. learn about social design and social change i kind of came the opposite way around so i was like where is the greatest, where is design being used? Well, it's been used to make sense of social problems. It's transforming businesses. And I went down the steps almost to really understand, you know, what, you know, not just paying a lip service, like not just going to a design thinking workshop and duplicating it, having a few post-its, getting a bit of energy going and saying, yep, yeah, right, I'm a designer, I'm a creative now. I'm, when really all you are is a business consultant wearing a creative's coat. Um, I worked really closely with and tried to develop very, you know, very rudimentary um, creative practices myself because I wanted to learn what was the diff what was the real difference between strategizing in a workshop and actually sitting down and making the thing. Like, mm -hmm. what is that? What is the difference? And it is a difference in creativity. It's a difference in way of thinking when you do that. When you are not just focused on right, we've got this output and we've got this amount of time and we need to get to X you know, the, the opportunity to sit and actually to, to be forced to slow down in making something, mm -hmm. I think really does enable you to think differently. You are forced to think differently by doing it. And that is why I think there is a real, um, that difference of thinking, that depth of understanding something that, um, that need to bring in different perspectives and to discuss things that might not seem of immediate relevance with others is mm. something that I see designers doing a lot that we don't off really, even if we are in design, even if we are design thinking experts, as I think maybe my LinkedIn profile says, we often don't find enough space for that. And it's really right. hard in mm -hmm. the business world making yeah. a case for that. Well, I kind of uh, um, uh, relate to, um, to your, um, you know, yeah, slowing, you have to sometimes slow down and then mm -hmm. really think about it. And and you don't have space and time for that often, right? Because that's, I think that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest challenge probably is slowing down the time. Because we don't have, there, so there's simply no um, language uh, to explain the value of slowing down of of just or sometimes even doing nothing um mm -hmm. th th it's that that's just not a there's never a positive thing but uh but in research um in psychology mm -hmm. we know and if you you know in, if you look at how your brain functions and how you have to kind of kind of uh, allow your brain to process things uh it because even if you're if say physically you're not doing anything your brain is working really hard and uh, we can call that mind wandering. I think this is the only kind of positive word I know. Otherwise, it's just like being lazy, doing nothing, regret, procrastination. <laughs> it's like you know, it's like uh, come on, get some work done, move, move, move. But you, but moving, g getting on with it, sometimes means s don't do something now. Mm -hmm. Wait, right, right. stop. You know, um, and then um, I had a. Um, in a few interview one of my my, my latest podcast with uh, becky wright and she had this wonderful quote 
because uh, she said uh, she calls herself a modern day alchemist. And I said, mm -hmm. um, so that you're so you're looking for gold. And she said, yeah, but the interesting thing about gold is that if you go down to the river, you find gold where the water runs slow, not where it's mm -hmm. running fast. That's not where you find the gold. And they're like, oh yeah, that's so <laughs> so profound in a, in a, yeah. in a very that's simple a way. It's like, metaphor, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like, yes, but, and it's so true, mm -hmm. right? And, but how do you, but how do you cope with that? Because you see that. Um, and I think you, you know, I think the, the misfit that you are is actually, I, I think, I would I would translate misfit to someone who bridges different worlds together, mm -hmm. different languages, different ways of thinking, different perspectives, uh, and at least seeing them, seeing all these kind of differences, and understanding you know the uh, the value of bringing them together, um, which in a way the word so in the way the word misfit doesn't make sense if you look at it from that way. It's actually you're trying to fit things together mm -hmm. that are not fitted so i would say you're not the misfit everything else is <laughs> <laughs> that is that is a nice way of putting it and i do think that you know um I, i'm not i'm not very sure on the uh, the misfit tag because it does have kind of a negative connotation but well it means that um, you're being told you know you're being in a way i'm just i mean this is the first time i actually thought about it that way because i think i like i'm a misfit i like being a misfit uh i call myself a trespasser often because mm -hmm. i i then you venture into kind of spaces that are not mine i haven't studied that mm -hmm. you're not a researcher you're not a whatever wherever i go people are like they're experts and they and i'm not an i'm a generalist i'm not yeah. an expert in anything really mm -hmm. um but i like many many things uh, as 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 most people actually do if you dig down deep enough anyway but but the misfit mm -hmm. it, it it has this there's something negative about being a misfit as if you are the one that doesn't fit but actually what what happens is that you are someone who's also a bit of a generalist mm -hmm. because you can see different worlds and you can bring them together. So you are you are someone who are a, I don't know what the right word for that is, but you're bridging. You're, yeah. you're you can you're you're creating you're translating bridges. Translating different different groups and different languages, and you're creating a space in yeah. which you know everyone can belong. And I think that's the yeah. thing that I try to do. But it's because that sense of, of your belonging background. within a yeah. group. Yeah, exactly. But it is because of your kind of background of, you know, these, and, and this is a pattern that I see with many people in this sort of creative space mm -hmm. is that they, first of all, they often are misfits or they see themselves as misfits and they, they, they did kind of, um, you know, they've always been looking for connection, but never really be able to connect to specific groups would always kind of, you know, there were sort of in between those spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's an interesting pattern, but it is because of your basically um, carving out your own space and your own direction by saying you go to law school. I mean, most people who go to law school, you know, they basically take things for granted. I think they all, they, it's just the way it is. It's like, this is law school. This is what they're being taught. They're going to be a lawyer. Um, uh, but there's, there's a few people who say, well, mm, nah. Oh, I'm interested in something else. Well, there's something else. Let's go do that. Take that road. Let's say. And so you combine something mm -hmm. that is maybe even unique. You can make a combination of things. And so mm -hmm. if I would teach anyone, like, you know, if I, so my, I mean, my, my son is eight and my daughter's 14. I try to tell him things like, you know, yes, you go to school. My son is eight, so can, I can't tell him this yet, but my daughter. Uh, so, you know, you don't have, you, you, you're sure, you know, School wants you to make a decision, wants mm -hmm. to, you to choose a direction. You, They'll tell you, like, you have to know which school you're going to go next. And he's 14, right? And I try to tell, like, that's just your first choice. You know, don't worry yeah. about it. You're going to have that's many the first, other That's the first outfit you're going to try on. Exactly. And you're going to have to mix and match things to figure out what is the, the right fit for you. It's kind of like, yeah, maybe it's like kind of like bricolage or knitting together a beautiful quilt you know you can put the things together in a certain way whether it's for you personally in your life or within yes. you know a group or on a project you're working on yeah. but then you can unpick the stitches and put things differently and fit things together differently it's it's yeah. figuring out how to 
yeah, create that sense of belonging for yourself. Exactly. So it's, you know, so it's not misfit. It's not, as well, yeah. yeah. So you're not a misfit. It's actually mm -hmm. you are a fitter. You, you, you are connecting things. You're the tailor you're, who's you're putting connector. everything together. Yeah, you're, yeah, exactly. So it's actually, uh, it's, it, that's an inter, inter, interesting thought, actually. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. like, oh, wait a minute. There's something wrong with that word. So, but how do you, how do you then, then now kind of deal with that? Because, uh, because the dominant force is sort of telling you, you are a misfit and you don't, you know, you, they don't allow you the time that you think is needed, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the space to kind of sometimes just slow down and, and really think about what, what's going on. And how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think that that's something that we all, whether we're in a creative industry or not, you know, if you are trying to, if you see yourself as a leader, or maybe you don't see yourself as a leader, but if you're trying to do something different within your organization or within your community or the space that you're in, you have to, yeah, you do need time to think and you do need to time to recharge as well and a, and a time to kind of mull over different inspirations and different inputs and figure out how they might fit together and then share them with others and see what their insights are and maybe there's a whole bit of cloth if we're taking the metaphor further that you didn't know existed that they can bring to bear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't have an easy answer for that I think the the one thing that um, you know there are lots of I've I've you know gobbled down loads of different you know leadership and business uh, treatises and try to learn the best way of doing things. And the only way to do it, I've learned, is really kind of putting it into practice. So, and how do you do that? How do you put that into practice? What does that mean? Um, I think it is being part of it is being reflective and noticing patterns in yourself. So, I notice mm -hmm. it's difficult in the moment to make time when you have a million and one things to do and you have lots of deadlines and lots of people to get back to and lots of outputs you need to create to justify creative time or research time or time away from the computer to have a walk and to recharge. Right. But if you look back and you reflect, you can know to yourself that you are not productive and not creative and not mm. the colleague or the collaborator or the leader you need to be if you are constantly working at like 100% productivity. Because productivity and a focus on that above all else can be the enemy to doing anything truly new or creative. Right. Because exactly. when you're doing something new, the outcome, if it's new, the outcome is uncertain. So the language of productivity is not valuable or the value of productivity yeah. is, yeah. it's a, a necessary evil. You know, your boss or, you know, you're, you're going to have to kind of justify your time somehow. But I firstly push for time within my working week in which I can explore. That is one I try and as much as possible to build it into any projects that I'm working on. So it is an explicit part of the project timeline um, that takes a degree of trust. So either you're, you know, you, you, you have a strong reputation or you have built trust within your organization that they know that this is needed. So I have kind of business cases where I'll say, right, I know that we've got loads to do, but I'm telling you now, if we don't take the time to consider this upfront, we are going to run in the wrong direction and end up creating something that doesn't meet our needs, doesn't meet our customers' needs, our users' needs, our community members' needs. How do you, how do you create that space for people? Because that, I mean, it, I, I think most people will kind of understand. I think mm -hmm. most people are smart enough to understand that that, is, that makes total sense. However, mm -hmm. it also makes them very nervous and because it is not reward it mm -hmm. in the same way that productivity has and unless so i so um i have to i i when we were saying this and i thought about this experience that i had once when i was young i was working in a bookshop and a shop and there were you know just it was books and there were different categories and i had my section uh of books i had to take care of and uh, and I, I don't know why I had to. This made me think of what your 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 story. Um, I um, you cannot and that's so I, I can't go into a shop anymore uh, without noticing this because if you're in the shop, um, customers basically they come in usually all at the same time, and then and then it's end. There's nothing to do. 
it's done. I mean, there's no client, there's no customers in the shop. You have nothing to do, but you you have to look busy because mm-hmm. when someone comes in, you can't just hang around or sit somewhere and have a drink of coffee. So I was kind of putting the books in order, straightening straightening out the books mm-hmm. or something. And you see this in all the shops, like you know, straightening the clothes or whatever. Dude, I do. They're busy. They're doing. They have nothing to do. Mm-hmm. They have nothing to do. So. And I had that kind of that kind of when you were saying this, uh, kind of that that image came to mind of because there is this feeling of you have to be active. It's yes. but, but even if it's nonsense, mm-hmm. being active, being productive, doing something is mm-hmm. is rewarded, is seen as positive. But when, when when you're saying, well, we're not going to do we're not going to move for we have to really think about this and and mm-hmm. so that kind of makes you really nervous it make at least made my boss because i was i yeah. like drawing and i would he i got like you know um he almost fired me one day because i he caught me sitting somewhere making drawings mm-hmm. there were no customers in the room but it doesn't matter you know you have to <laughs> be pro do stuff do something yeah. you know yeah and uh and so i'm, I'm paying for your time and you need to find something that yes, valuable find something to do, to do. even something. if it's not valuable just give me the impression exactly. that, that you're that you're earning yes. the wage yeah yeah because visually i want to see you work right mm-hmm. so 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 that's so ingrained it's so in our system it's so part of of how we grow up in in businesses and 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 what we're being told in school yeah. you know look active and and you know even in schools this is i think a rule yeah. You know, the, the, appearance, the appearance of being productive is paramount. And I think that it's it's a big problem for businesses at the minute. If we look, you know, post COVID-19, post yes. lockdown, ha- businesses, you know, that businesses who don't trust their staff to use their time effectively. And you see the difference in productivity between those who are maybe being observed via their webcam to check that they are doing the right thing or they've got kind of spyware on their, oh their device God. versus, you know, people who just, you know, the, the, the bosses who just trust you to like, you know, fill in your timesheet and do the work and meet, meet your requirements and things. And um, yeah. it's, it's tough. I think that it's, and, and it's, it's another thing. It's kind of, it's self-motivated as well. Like we value as individuals, the feeling of being productive because we've been educated to. So you might have a big project to work on, but you put it off because it's. I, I get a sense of I've done something if I complete my spreadsheet, and that it has its value. It needs to be done, but you'll do yes. all of the easy things first, yeah, because they have a definitive outcome, and you'll feel good at the end of it. Exactly, that's not always a bad thing, you know. Get feeling productive, giving yourself that confidence can be a good. Of course, of course, but, but then how did you create that space mm-hmm. for people to f- say, okay, we'll, you know, and and how do you do that you know without making them very anxious and very nervous and and, and like and, and and how do you create that feeling of you know of trust or that safe space for people if i was thinking about kind of tangibly so thinking about kind of maybe getting a new project started you're working with maybe a new team i would want to obviously get everyone together maybe not in person it's not possible for us where i am at the moment but to get everyone together and to set um the sort of, if you have a a vision or an outcome for the project, set that. Make sure that everyone is is in agreement with it. Kind of set the expectation that you are looking for their input. You're looking for them to, we've all been recruited to do this because we all have our unique skills, but Mm. there's lots within this that we don't understand. You're an expert within your area and I want you to be able to bring your creativity to bear. So what are the things that, you know, you've worked maybe on projects before and you've not had the space or support to do really well in your role what say if you're if it's communications or if it's you know graphic design or whether what, what or whether it's research whatever it is that that individual is kind of a, a master at as a practitioner at where are their kind of untapped creative drives and how can you benefit from that within your project right. but also how can you set the kind of terms so they're not just going off wildly in one direction how can you have that north star of this is what we are trying to achieve together and we can't do it in, as individuals and are we sufficiently how can we frame this so that we are all passionate to a degree about the work that we are going to do together i would want to have that expectation up front and i would want to keep that goal that mission as central mm. to our work i would want and i would want to build space within whether it's within the working week or whether it's within every key team meeting for us all to um 
think creatively around the project that we're looking at. So I would be throwing in some inspiration or some provocations in there. I would say, I, I, we've been doing this research or I've discovered this, I've put together this insight into what we're looking at. What are your thoughts? What's coming in from your sector? What's coming in from your colleagues? Are there any interesting conversations or articles or mm. blog posts mm. or you know work that you've done that ties to this what are your thoughts so you're constantly creating that expectation of you have a positive responsibility to be um, mm. being creative within this process and to be bringing a unique perspective that none of the rest of us have so are people prepared to i mean is that because uh, um uh i can imagine that uh it takes a specific kind of person to be able to kind of feel comfortable in that space that you give them right because yeah. it is also um i think a lot of people just want to be told what to do because if you give them all that ownership or uh, they might get nervous of like i oh, i need now she asked she's asking me for an interesting article <sighs> i I haven't. Oh, I had now. Oh, I have to look for something really <laughs> profound, and I haven't. Found, and I'm not. You know, I should read more. And so there's a. So it might even come mm -hmm. across as more pressure on them uh, when. Uh, and maybe that's actually good to create some. Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit of an incentive for them to kind of think outside of the sort of <laughs> box, if you will. Uh, but 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 how does that? How, what's your experience there? Do, do people kind of? like accept that or are they, is it is it the pressure that, that, that they feel like is a negative thing or is it something that are you challenging them or is mm -hmm. it is it a specific person that kind of you kind of that is attracted to that how does that work that's a really interesting question and i think it's probably something that comes up in maybe if you want to say my tailoring practice bringing these people together right um i would wonder i would as well if i have not worked with someone previously Mm -hmm. um, often in these types of projects, if you're working in, I work within the innovation space. Mm -hmm. If you work within innovation projects, the people who have been assigned to there, they tend to be a bit more creative within their own role. They tend to be um, active problem solvers. They tend to be adaptable. That's n not always the case. So if you're talking about the individual who's maybe, you know, been thrown into this and they don't see, you know, uh, what are your thoughts on this as an mm. invite to, oh, the, the, the mic is mine, you know, you know this, and maybe you're, I would imagine you're this type of individual. Someone asks for your opinion on something and you're like, oh, well, actually I have a lot of opinions on that. Even if I'm not an expert, I'm comfortable sharing and I've, there's mm. different things I can pull together. But as you've mentioned, not everyone is comfortable within that. So I would want to have, mm. if, I, if I am ostensibly leading within this process, uh, and as the, maybe not even the leader, but as the person who takes responsibility for creating a sense of belonging mm. within that group, I would want to have a one-to-one -one with everyone and get a sense of, you know, what is their level of comfort within this? How, right. um, what is their experience in being asked to be a leader in their own right, to right. put their stamp on something? What are the, What is their current environment that they're working in? Because someone could be really kind of have a real creative drive but if they are in an environment in which they have been uh, they, they feel criticized a lot or they feel that they cannot um, live up to the expectations of their role if they are under a lot of pressure they are not in that expansive sharing mindset they are in a defensive uh, withdrawn it's sen a threat sensing mindset and that is something that needs to be taken into account and I right. would probably, if I identified that within someone, I would want to do a bit more one-to-one -one work with them. Right. So I could model and show to them, look, I don't have all the answers here. I'm setting this. Maybe I'm, set, maybe I'm helping to shape the, the mission that we're, we're tackling mm. or helping to get the board, get momentum around this going. So I might be the one who's saying, right, this is the way we're going, guys. But I want everyone to be putting their thumbprint on it. And it right. might take a bit more one-to-one -one work working closely, building that sense of trust and getting a sense of how comfortable is that person. So, you know, when you're asking them to get involved, you're not saying, right, tell me about the latest thinking within your, um, within like your sector or within your skill set on this, because that would be quite threatening to them. It's more, mm. you know, um, maybe you bring, you bring them in more softly. You know, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think, given your experience, that what we're talking about would resonate well with the audience that you know or that would work functionally you know have you or do you have any experiences of um you know things that you can put forward that 
examples from past projects you've been involved in right. this might not work or um softening the questions you know get, and I, but i would recommend that anytime you know if you are trying to bring people together and create that sense of belonging start right. from a quite an open uh quite a like l- a less demanding uh questioning point and then you can build up as you get a sense of who what those individuals are and you know and what their level of comfort with sharing is and maybe they're really comfortable sharing and it's more of a matter of coaching them and guiding them in your yeah. your role within this space is not to be heard it is to make sure that we are all heard and that the best ideas are being incorporated into what we're working on and model that within my own behavior so yeah. that the people who are less likely to share feel comfortable doing so and the people who can dominate a bit see the value in making sure that they aren't the ones yeah. who are leading to two degrees degree yeah so so that's uh being a um a facilitator as a leader mm-hmm. right um whether you are you know whether, whether that's a you know whether there's a kind of a hierarchy going on or not but it's still a uh it's 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 somehow it's building trust but it's also a lot about empathy and and you know spending time mm-hmm. understanding the individuals that you're kind of bringing together I find it interesting that, uh, and this might, maybe there's no, that's not really something that you experience, uh, but because in the beginning of your story, you talk about, uh, you know, being a misfit and, and not feeling that you were connected to any groups. And, and now you're, you know, you're all about a sense of belonging. And I'm, mm-hmm. I, 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 somehow my brain was like, because you didn't, you know, as a child, you never really felt you belonged anywhere that actually makes you because usually those kind of things being on the outside of something makes you also very profoundly um and acutely aware of how that actually works because you're the outsider Mm -hmm. and then somehow being that sort of on the outside of things you might want to belong to it makes you kind of an expert on belonging Mm -hmm. because you didn't feel that and, yeah, and, and you have was... to, it doesn't happen, if it doesn't happen naturally, you have to learn, you have to right. consciously learn the skills. Yeah, that's a way better way of saying that, yeah. There's an interesting truism I often think about um, that says like, you know, they say the best players often make terrible coaches. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you are naturally good at something, if you've got a natural aptitude, or you're kind of like, for example, in sport, if you have a certain physicality that lends itself to the sport that you, that you play, mm-hmm. um. Those those types of individuals can not always be the best at teaching others because they it came to them naturally. It's not exactly. that they didn't work hard and they didn't have to refine their yeah. practice, but exactly you know. But you can't be them. Yeah, like so. For example, if they if they if they're coaching and they've got a player or a team member who you know just so that the, and the other example might be a really someone who is naturally successful as an entrepreneur doesn't it just has that kind of self confidence and that drive and just goes they might not be the best leader of a bigger team. In fact, we see it a lot. The person who is really driven to grow and really driven to achieve doesn't necessarily have that insight as to say, right, well, I don't get why this individual here just can't do it. Because I like, you know, their their advice effectively is be more like me or just get it done. And if something's stopping someone from contributing or progressing or doing whatever it is that they're tasked with, you know, just say, like, just do it is not really a, a very good, sorry to Nike, but it's not a very good, you know, motivational piece because if they could, they would. I, I believe that most people, they, they want to be valuable. They want to be included. Yeah. They don't want to be failing. So <laughs> that's very interesting. I Connecting that to the uh, Nike. Uh, now, now I can't hear it anymore. It's like, come on, just do it. Just, just <laughs> do it, man. Just get on with it. Get on with it. You know, I can't do it. <laughs> Man, oh god, yeah, oh, there goes uh, the, there goes the brand. Sorry, I'm sure this is going to be incredibly detrimental to the stock price. <laughs> you know, my podcast has <laughs> big reach. Inf- a big reach, yeah. No, so they- I'll keep an eye out. The Times of London, Nike stock price plummets after le- after the leadership podcast was published. <laughs> yeah, can you please take that? Part out of the podcast it's hurting our business now that would be awesome no no i don't think so i think 
Yeah, it's interesting. So that's my belief that because I have had yeah. to think really consciously exactly. about how you create these yeah. groups and these spaces yes. and these teams where everyone can bring themselves to the table and can have an influence on something that yes. I've, I've had to develop that and had to be really conscious. Yeah, but also your your um, upbringing of being self-sufficient. So being sort of this, because self-leadership is a big, mm. is a big topic, is a big thing, right? Self-leadership. And you have been brought up to be a, you know, you know, taking care of your own business, mm -hmm. but you also had kind of this, re you know, reflective moment of saying, well, that actually can't, but there are parts of that that you can bring to the team mm -hmm. of having, you know, take care of, of your own, you know, your own, take, to take the responsibility of what you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. you know? So self-leadership is yeah. really important, but then, and then always also with mixing that with this sense of belonging, mm -hmm. that's a, that's a wonderful mix, right? So self-leadership, mm -hmm. but also having a sense of belonging with a group, yeah. Yeah. I think you need, I think that with my reflection is that you need that safety net. If you're going to ask people to do really risky things and the further right. you get in your career, the riskier things are, because if you have a certain role, people expect you to have the answers. People look up to you. You have to be very conscious about bringing other people in the conversation. Right. So you aren't by default the leader because your ideas might not be the best, Right. but also, you know, the, 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 you know, that if you want to do something really meaningful, that the risk is high, the risk of, of failure can be high and you can't expect your team to be taking risks and thinking creatively and working in a different way. If you don't create that sense of belonging and that sense of right, we're asking you to do something different. But if it doesn't work out, you know, let's let's assess it between ourselves. Let's test it out. Let's experiment. Let's kind of come up with a prototype and find somewhere safe to test this idea before we roll it out. You can't expect people to be kind of putting their reputations on the line or feeling like their reputation is on the line, even if mm. they, if what they are doing doesn't work. Yeah. So the safety be, net. Yeah. Giving them a safety net, giving them a safe space to play in. So rather than right. expecting them to figure it all out on their own and roll it out, you want to be involved within the process of experimenting and playing around with whatever it is you're creating and testing it out in low fidelity, low risk ways. So you're not creating that sense of, you know, the risk of failure for the organization, but also the risk of failure for the individual that they've done all of this and it didn't work. And now they have this crisis of confidence. You know, you shouldn't be setting up a, an individual for that. And that sense of belonging within a team is a really good antidote for that sense of, particularly at the minute, isolation, self-doubt that can come around from rattling around in our heads yeah. too much. Yeah. We're all behind a screen day to day. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How do we create that sense of belonging mm. virtually if we can't be in physical space with each other and read our body language as well as we used to be able to? Exactly. But but then that part of self-leadership becomes mm -hmm. so important, right? So being able to to kind of, um, you know, it, it could, the feeling of belonging, I think you can, I mean, yes, we, we're, so, we're so missing sort of these coming together but at the same time there's so many companies are out there uh you know global companies who uh, you know so there's people out there who have colleagues around the world and and they actually were working this way anyway so mm -hmm. you know a lot of companies uh, but big corporates um you know they they they've been working remotely uh before before this crisis mm -hmm. and so in a way it isn't new for everyone except that now it is all of a sudden for everyone. <laughs> so, it's for so. everyone. And you're not, you're not necessarily, a, yeah, if you, like where, where I am at the moment, we're in like serious, like strong lockdown measures. So you're not necessarily getting going to the exercise class or, you know, even out to the, you know, out to the shops yeah. or what have you, that would yeah. be an antidote for being at home. Transition so much, moments. But, we're missing yeah. moments of transition. I, I, mm -hmm. I was, yeah, I was talking to, I actually, there's a topic that, that, comes up quite often nowadays it's the moment of transition you, you you know like you have a call and after that call there's another call and there's another call and you can't you, you're not going you're not commuting uh you're yeah. not going to go down the hallway uh, mm -hmm. or have uh, with uh, with your colleagues and have coffee or or have lunch mm -hmm. uh you know in the cafeteria or whatever it's 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 mm -hmm. it's uh it's all just kind of one big stream of like screen, online just, yeah online 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 offline but i'll put on right. netflix 
So yeah, so uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's the reality. We, we, we you have to kind of cope with and learn mm -hmm. to kind of create new patterns and new ways of. But but still, self leadership is there mm -hmm. for a really interesting topic, and it's I think it's a it's a huge topic, and mm -hmm. it's something we, we are not teaching people. Yeah, absolutely, and I think there's something to bring back to that. So there there was utility in I suppose the the values I was raised with. But they did, the more I moved into kind of, you know, space of wanting to be innovative and wanting to create something, the more of a straight jacket it became. Right. And my learning was that, you know, self-management, the most valuable lesson of self-management I've had to learn is either asking for help or putting out there something mm. that's unfinished, just throwing something together and saying, this is where my thoughts are at. What do you think? Because so much of my upbringing and my education was get it perfect, do it yourself. Right. And that, you know, you can move very quickly in that, but you can't lead if you're in that mindset because you need other people to be coming along with you. Right. And, you know, I've got, I haven't pulled the trigger on it, but I've got this sort of draft blog that I've been meaning to publish for a while. It's like why I'm a terrible designer. And uh, I think that you mentioned it was really interesting. You've kind of, you've identified that I went from a sense of maybe of not feeling like I belonged to making that almost the central um kind of value and central um, task that I feel that I feel like I, I should be bringing to my yeah. workspaces and my communities, a, a space in which everyone feels included, not like, you know, in terms of I have an issue with diversity and inclusion because it starts from the, the assumption that, you know, it, it starts, it's a bit of a, a narrow kind of focus on, well, um, how can we make sure everyone is, is not included? How can we make sure that everyone is included? But really it should be the assumption that everyone is included and look really consciously at the barriers that prevent right. that. But right. that's that's a whole other conversation yeah, we can yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, Great thought. are you gonna publish? When are you gonna publish I, it? I think I think I will. I think you've inspired me through this conversation to pull it together. But I suppose my, my my final thought on that was that like I have identified, I think the areas in which a like, cow was raised and how I've been taught have not been conducive to being a good leader, being innovative, being, you know, working well within the design space, because I've kind of had, I've developed this intrinsic value of I should have the answer by myself. I should be able to figure it out by myself. I should be able to, um, yeah, get, kind of get things moving and not have to be vulnerable and deal with all of that internally right. and deal with that self-doubt rather than opening up and saying, guys, I, I, like, I'm, I'm stuck here. I, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, because you know, you, you are, if, if you take that approach, you are limiting yourself from the fantastic insight of your colleagues and your collaborators and people who've had totally different experiences yeah. and you're putting so much pressure on yourself to be right that you can't, you don't have the flexibility to have fun. Yeah, but asking for help or, you know, allowing other people to teach you something mm -hmm. it means that you didn't know. Mm -hmm. And not knowing is, it's not, you know, it makes you extremely vulnerable in a space where we often end up in, where people feel that they have to be mm -hmm. the expert and they have to know. And not knowing is sort of, uh, it's, yeah. it's just, just usually not a very positive thing. Absolutely. But it does mean, you know, again, if you, you know, if you look at it closely, you, you know, you don't know because we're all just mm -hmm. human beings. You don't know everything. You can't know everything. Nobody knows everything. We're all just trying. We're all just mm -hmm. trying to figure out stuff. And 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 we need. I mean, it's it's just it's such common. So my what I find so frustrating is that many of these kind of things are are simply common sense. We all know that diversity of thought is is so important and that they're taking different angles and you mm -hmm. know in research you know triangulating or whatever you know you you know taking different points of view that is so important you cannot do this yourself it's too things are mm -hmm. you know everything you know whatever topic or whatever project you're on even though at first it seems very simple it turns into something very complex you can't mm -hmm. do everything yourself Absolutely. so asking for help uh, I, I mean, it's, of course you should be able to, but then why don't we? Why don't we teach people? Why don't we so teach? People? Yeah, so much of our education system, I think, is on you as an individual having the answer and you with the exam, like yeah. you said, and it and, and it excludes so many individuals like yourself who that does not work for. Exactly, but it means that we have so much to unlearn 
when we get into the workplace. And maybe that's why, you know, my my drive towards creating spaces of belonging has mm-hmm. been an antidote to that feeling of I need to have all the answers myself. Because yeah. for so long within my, per- my personal professional life, I felt that my value came from being smart and having the right answer. And it was really right. threatening for me to move into these spaces where I was trying to create something bigger than myself. Um, anything that is innovative, anything that you know is bigger than yourself requires you to work with others. You can't do it on your own. And it became, while I had a real drive to connect, I felt really threatened by not having, not having the answer, not be seen having the answer, not having a clear route forward because I had my background and my education did not prepare me for that. And I feel like I've really dug into the design thinking space almost as kind of like a, as an attempt at personal transformation, as an attempt to unpick all of those, you know, uh, you know, unuseful and unhelpful learnings from earlier in my life, because you can't create anything big with it, without others, without creating, without handing over some of the ownership, without sharing, without engaging everyone within It's that. a very good thought. It's a very good thought. I know, sorry, I, I thought that you, you just linked design thinking to unlearning. Mm-hmm. And to me, um, I think for, 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 for many, many people, that is what it actually is all about. Mm-hmm. It is about unlearning and, it, and that is sometimes painful um, because it makes you extremely it's all, yeah, it's vulnerable. It's always painful. Yeah. Because all because, of the yeah. models that you had that you could rely on that gave you a sense yeah. of certainty don't fit anymore and you're out you're there. Exactly. And yeah. you're like, well what, well, what do I do now? Yeah. Yeah. And, th- and this is where design thinking often is sort of t- turn into a another fixed model saying, mm-hmm. you know, a fixed process because yeah. it's you, it makes you feel comfortable. Uh-huh. And it's, uh, it's, it's a... Um, and I don't think it's a bad place to start. I know no, that like, when, I, when I first teach or when I first engage with design thinking, you know, the different models that are yeah. used yeah. are really helpful. They're like stabilizers on a bike, sure. training wheels. You know, they, <laughs> they give you, they enable you to get a bit further and you can find your balance and you can pick your own route, but then you reflect and you realize that, well, you know, it's, it's not the be all and end all. There are different ways of working. And this is just one yeah. under, way of understanding a very complex yeah. pro complex yeah. process of creativity, but complex process of life yeah. and, and doing things with others. But that's a big leap from having the stabilizers, mm-hmm. realizing you have stabilizers, but you're, but you can also go without them. So I always use this uh, analogy of, 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 of uh, or this narrative of cooking. When you start cooking, you've never cooked before. You need a recipe book. But if you want to be a chef, you know, there's a, there's that, that's, you know, that's a big leap. There's a journey. You have to teach um, yourself to, to experiment and let go and try and, 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 not, and, and basically, mm-hmm let go of the recipes but the recipes are there so you know so so i think it's uh um what i'm how my experience is now is that and i again we don't we shouldn't be in a hurry but i feel that a lot of people are stuck with having the Mm. trainer wheels having sort of the recipe book and thinking that is it Mm -hmm. and then often using it and thinking like and, uh, and because it, it, it doesn't help them with that, what I, because they're not, they're no chef and they, it's, mm-hmm. you know, and then they're like, ah, that's it. And it's just a process and they go and they, they fit it into whatever, um, you know, whatever box they have in their business. I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not frustrated, but I'm a little bit impatient mm-hmm. uh, that I'm like, no people, come on. It's not, it's not about the process or the, 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 it's not about design thinking. Mm-hmm. There's something else. There's something more profound, more deep mm-hmm. going on that we have to address. But maybe but, that's the. It, maybe it's reframing your frustration then, because I think that the re- like use the analogy. The cooking book is really important because then it gives us all a shared base of knowledge. There's a touchstone yeah. for us to, to work from. Exactly. But then we do need to, you know, if you if you do want to become a chef, and most of us do, I imagine anyone who's giving spare time to listen to a leadership podcast is very uh, keen on self development and yeah. development for for their organization and the people around them. Yes. Um, but you know, you need to, like so if you, if you are wanting to become a chef, you know, you do need to find those opportunities to take the training wheels off. But that you so you're first you're pedaling maybe on grass, 
because you are going to fall over and you don't exactly. want to hurt yourself too badly. So you don't yeah. jump from, you know, making a small meal from a recipe. Maybe then you kind of build up confidence and then you make it for a lot more people or you make it for a big group. But then when you kind of go off and go by yourself and try and figure out, right, well, how can I make this fit better into this scenario, for example? Yeah. You're not going to go and then make your first recipe from scratch for a group of 20. You're going to make it for yourself or your best friend or your roommate or your partner yeah. um, who are going to be a very kind of kind audience. And so it doesn't work. And you learn from that and you right. find those opportunities to keep progressing um, without exactly. having to risk too much of your, you know, have a failure or a, 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 a a bump to your ego um so safe space yeah and i uh, encourage yeah. anyone to do that try and find a space whether it's within your organization or outside a group maybe it's a fellow misfits or people who are kind of looking to develop their skills find a group that you can yeah. try things out with and you can take your problems to them and maybe there isn't you so you can say look guys i've been tasked with doing this i've got to do this big pitch i've got to do this presentation i've got to scope this project can you help me with it because and then you can play around with being creative because there's no risk of you know of losing so maybe that's the question to ask of any of the leaders listening you know where is your playground where do you recharge and get a chance to try new things before you unleash them on the wider world yeah good advice that's good <laughs> advice thank you i i um thank you very much for uh for this uh, interview um thank you for I, inviting me it's been, yeah. it's been interesting for myself to reflect on uh on some of the things that I've experienced and to hear your experiences as well. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. I like, I, I wrote this down that productivity is the enemy of creating something new, which mm -hmm. I kind of liked as well. <laughs> so, uh, um, no, I, 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 I recognize a lot in what you're saying, um, being sort of, you know, the misfits, but that teaches you so much about mm -hmm. belonging. And uh, because you have to consciously work on it and think about it, and you know, it, it, it is a. Um, I, I so what this kind of um, story kind of uh, at least uncovered for me as well as that you know this idea of if you're the outsider, you have and you have to work harder to become an insider. That is actually a skill. Mm -hmm. that's amazing so I, that's that which is so important nowadays so if you, what you're doing is you know creating these kind of uh, these communities and this the sense of belonging in your team it's because you had to work really hard at it and that's mm -hmm. a logical conclusion in a way but i never thought about it that way in such yeah. a yeah. so thank you for sharing that <laughs> um and um yeah I, uh, I I want to know more about your article. So uh, and uh, <laughs> you've, you've, insp so, you've inspired me to get out there and publish it. So go I'll, do uh, it when you publish it. Where will you publish it? Oh, I've, I usually just use Medium and LinkedIn, okay. but I will. I'll make sure you have the link so you can yeah. have it. Yeah. Okay. Read. And maybe maybe it'll be version one, and then I'll uh, I'll iterate right. it again. Cool. I think people would like to uh, read that. So Definitely. thank you very I'll, much. I'll share it with you so you can share it with your uh, your audience. Cool. Yes. Value. Thank you so much for your time. It's been it's been great to talk.